Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part 19 of Galileo Conquest and we are just blowing all our cash on all the upgrades. We basically have now spent all the money to upgrade everything to the bestest version available. But we still have a number of contracts related to, uh, well, getting detailed surface data of the moons. If you remember, we previously unlocked the resource scanner and, of course, that means we get contracts to actually go out and analyze our nearby moons for money and for science and for data. And perhaps I'm really hoping that one of these moons will provide a place that I can start mining materials, start mining materials for fuel so that we can really uh, use that to push out into deep space. I'm kind of, you know, kind of thinking that I really need to get the resource harvesting going. Now, obviously there uh, is, you know, there's some complexity associated with that. It might be better to just build a giant spacecraft. Certainly, there's a pretty strong argument for not bothering for a departure, but when you've visited the target and when you're thinking of potentially landing on the target, it actually starts to make a lot more sense for the very long journeys to be able to harvest materials locally and convert it to fuel. While we're going to pay a penalty for by having a more complex system, however, we will uh, instead benefit by having a much lower launch mass. And in the end, uh, I think that I gotta I gotta press out and do that. So we're going to be exploring the moons for this. We're probably going to put together a surface base to just analyze this. But this uh, spacecraft is heading to IOTA, of course, with the Express option, the express concept of collecting data on resources. Now, uh, I did this trick, I decided instead of going for the big, huge orbital inclination change that I would uh, handle the inclination change once I was out at the target. So we do a little bit of changes here and there, just tweaking this to make sure we pass over the poles. And then, of course, we have to set our uh, set our timer for this. Except that there are a lot of other timers that are going on right now. Sure, we're going to get out here. We get a time warp. We're going to make the little uh, correction here, which is about a really, really, really tiny amount of change there. Puts us in over the poles, and with a bit of work, we'll be able to get into orbit. Hundred and well, two hundred meters per second. That's going to be pretty good. We have uh, 1.4 kilometers per second. Of course, we could land this thing if we wanted to. But I'm pretty sure that maintaining this thing in orbit is going to make a lot more sense. So yeah, very, very quick trip out there. Uh, you'll notice that we do have um, Assumpta who will be requiring some assistance very soon. But now we're, it's telling us that we can perform scans at certain altitudes. And you'll notice that when we did the scan, there was a little uh, effect there on the surface showing that the, the resource scanner was running. Uh, that's a graphical effect, basically. To I don't, I'm not sure. I guess it indicates areas which are hot and cold and all that. I'm never quite sure how to describe that. Suffice to say that the easy part is getting the data. The hard part is going to be touching something down on the surface at the correct location and starting to harvest it. Probably start with an automated mission and then that will hopefully serve as the prototype to future harvesting missions to more distant bodies. Meanwhile, meanwhile we're headed towards Icarus. We're making the final correction burn that will put us onto an encounter with this target. Uh, for remembering to use the target scanning routine that I completely had for had neglected to use. Target scanning the sun at this time for great victory, for great profit, for great science, and maybe perhaps some awesome new technologies such as air fresheners. I would really like to travel with a uh, little hula girl on the dashboard, keeping my air nice and, you know, fresh. Fresh air in space is actually very important because, of course, everybody is in this small space and it's very compact and, uh, you know, toilets don't work in the same way. I mean, you know, you're really dealing with a bunch of people who may be required as part of their job to poop their pants. You know, when you're on a long EVA and you have to go, that's your only option. 
I get a little bit of a smile whenever I hear somebody joking that something is as welcome as a fart in a spacesuit. Because you know what? Farts in spacesuits are nothing compared to having to poop your pants in a spacesuit. People that design spacesuits have thought this through. At least I know that the US spacesuits not only include carbon dioxide scrubbers and of course oxygen and all that, they also include uh, filters to actually remove bad aromas. Not only that, but spacesuits are designed so that the freshest air comes in right at your face and the air that's kind of stale is extracted from the extremities. Thus, science and engineering has combined to solve the problem of a fart in a spacesuit. It really shouldn't be a problem unless you're perhaps one of those people that has maybe a nose on their hands and feet. I mean, let's face it, that would technically qualify as a superpower and if your career as an astronaut failed because you couldn't stand the smell that you were smelling through your hands and feet, I mean, it really does put smelly feet into a different whole different context. Um, yeah, no, you would have a career. I'm sure you could be some sort of crappy superhero, right? able to smell all sorts of things without bending over, presuming that you walk with your, you know, without any shoes on. Uh, anyway, yeah, we, uh, after having killed lots of dead air while I'm doing all the boring maneuvering and getting the thing close to the target, you can see that we finally have plotted a close approach to this rather beautiful looking new planet, Icarus. This is where the Galileo planet pack stuff really does start to shine. Their planets are, are all really distinctive looking. You know, Kerbal Space Program, the planets are kind of all very, mostly pretty dull looking to be honest. Although, you know, they've done, they've done pretty well, but Galileo just knocks it out of the park, metaphorically speaking. Although I wouldn't like to calculate what kind of baseball bat it would take to literally knock one of these out of a park. Anyway, um, one of the problems is that uh, I get there and now I figure out what it will take to put me into orbit and, well, I have 700 meters per second and this maneuver is 1,000, one kilometer per second. So, unfortunately, all that faffing around, those poorly chosen maneuvers, the basically trying to force an encounter of any sort, means that I am going to be unable to get into orbit around Icarus. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust my fly pass to be in the plane of the planet's orbit so that we will get a bit of a gravity assist that will change our orbit but it won't kick our inclination in and out. And then perhaps I can change my orbit so it actually touches their orbit of, of Icarus at, um, at a, a, a low velocity. Meanwhile, I completely forgot to include the launch footage of this other version of Dick SC. So this is named after Dick Byrne of Rocky Island. Basically launched two spacecraft, one to IOTA, one to SETI. They both launched pretty quickly in ter relative terms. And yeah, we're basically out here collecting contractually required scientific data and perhaps investigating the possibility of planting a flag next to a drill, next to a processing system, next to a giant fuel tank and maybe some more rockets for good measure. We're still using the, the base game system here, so we're you're basically are looking for generic ore deposits. It's not like Interstellar Quest where I specifically looked for water in one place and there was also the possibility of finding, I don't know, other things that weren't water. In this universe, there is a magic material called ore which can be processed into anything using all sorts of fancy chemical processes which are never quite specified. Perhaps the most relevant reaction to space is the Sabatier process. This was the one that uh, Zubrin suggested for his Mars Direct mission. The idea is, of course, that, well, the process converts hydrogen and carbon dioxide basically into uh, methane and oxygen. Of course, that is terribly simplifying things. That is the lies to children version of things. Yes, you get other things such as water and hydrogen and you have to maybe run the process several directions and you might need help from the Bosch process and things like this. But ultimately, chemically, you aim to take hydrogen that you carry with you to Mars and then you mix it with local carbon dioxide and bingo, you have rocket fuel for returning. Anyway, for now, in real life and in this playthrough, 
Such dreams are in the future. We still need to investigate the places we're going. This is uh, the probe Sister Assumpta. It is going to be visiting Thalia, which is a closer-in uh, planet. This was recorded live during a Twitch stream, and you notice we had some sort of weird glitch where my maneuver node reset itself in the middle of the maneuver. So I had to go back and recalculate, reproject everything to get my close approach down to what we needed it. As far as our telescopes can tell, Thalia is a small red world without any atmosphere. Which means we're not going to be aerobraking. Not that we actually plan on aerobraking any of these space probes, because none of them are really made for it. I should have probably thought about that when I was building things. Yeah, we're just going to bring that in over the pole once again to maximize our coverage of all available biomes. It also looks like there is a moon around Thalia which we can possibly investigate. Now, that's where we have to be careful about, you know, do we go for the moon first? Do we go into a polar orbit? Um, I may have to make a change of decision at some point, but we're, we're a couple of months away from getting here. We still have time to make some course corrections if we want to perhaps encounter the moon. The moon, of course, hasn't actually been discovered according to discovery bodies. The, that version there, I've never actually patched it. I instead have just been going into the save file and adding in the, the file, adding in the planet name, the body name, uh, so I can actually run the discovery process against it. Because otherwise the mod when I installed it did not work and that's the way I've been playing it. Now if this sounds suspiciously like cheating to you, Maybe it is, but you know what? It's been pretty common in all of my playthroughs to have to hand edit bits of the save file to account for bugs in various mods here and there. One of my favourite being during the Interstellar Quest days when a bug in remote tech led to duplicated spacecraft. Which sounds cool, it means you're getting two copies of a spacecraft, right? Who, what's not to like? Well, what's not to like was the fact that they would both turn up in exactly the same location. So you would load one, and then you would load the other, and they would both be in the same place, and they would, of course, explode into many, many little, little pieces, probably because of something like the Blinovich limitation effect. And if you got that reference, then I hope you're ex as excited for the new Doctor as I am. Anyway, continuing with the massive exploration program, it turns out the window to Gratian is here. And of course, we're just going to take our standard space probe and launch it into space with an eye to sending it to Gratian and unlocking its secrets. Of course, one of the downsides of having a universe which I've never really explored before and isn't based on a real thing is I have no idea what Gratian is like. So I guess I could just look up Wikipedia and find out that uh, Gratian was a Roman emperor from 367 to 383, the, the twilight years of the Roman Empire. The eldest son of Valentinian I, and during his youth, Gratian accepted, accompanied his father on campaigns in the Rhine and the Danube, and various things. And that was all very interesting, and then I realized that Gratian is actually a long way from the sun, and therefore the dinky little solar panels that I've been using uh, probably aren't going to be up to the task. Similarly, Otho is definitely way the heck out there, so we're going to need something else. Sister Margaret 2, the sequel, Sister Margareter. Uh, wait, that's the worst tagline ever. Look, what this is, we basically take the, the probe that we already had in all its awesome glory, same launch vehicle, same pretty much everything, and we just took the biggest solar panels we could find and slapped them on the side. Obviously, we're still working on developing our solar panel technology, but we all know that more area equals more um, electric charge things. I, I mean, at least in Interstellar, I knew that the electric charge came in the unit of megajoules, but this is just made-up electric charge units. At least I knew in Interstellar Quest that the units were in megajoules, which was a real unit, very easy to work with. Anyway, the departure window is a few days away, and in the meantime, we get our close encounter with Icarus, finally. Remember, this had to take an extra excursion around the sun, and we know that we're not going to be able to get into orbit. Instead, it's going to be doing the science equivalent of a drive-by. 
hitting the target with as much science instrumentation as possible and uh, yeah, measuring temperature in space, we all know that. Instrument read zero and the target, yeah, okay. All that, yes, yeah, science drive-by is go. And once again, admiring the beautiful design that the designer has put on Icarus. So yeah, this encounter is basically going radially outwards, which means pretty much I hit the encounter at exactly the wrong point to be any use. Um, now, while you might be thinking that I would be kicking myself for this, or at least metaphorically kicking myself, I'm not really kicking myself at all, so whether it's metaphorical or actual, it doesn't actually matter. Um, basically, it, it shows that I've encountered the thing at the worst place in the orbit, Therefore, my huge delta V requirements for getting into orbit are would be are amplified from what I should really need. So there there is hope yet that I can get this little space probe into orbit by making some corrections at the right place and the right time. You'll notice I've got this scan planetary mapping running right now. So we're actually mapping out a very tiny sliver of data of a you know, surface terrain. It looks pretty sweet. I bet you the boys back in the lab are really, really excited by this. Meanwhile, we're just target scanning, which is, uh, target scanning is just using the camera to take pictures of things. And we're just hitting every single biome. The good news is that because we're so close, our, uh, our solar cells are charging much, much faster, so we can pretty much send the data in real time. Whereas sending this from the moon with those dinky solar panels, or sending these from, you know, Gale space, has, um, it, it doesn't work because you run out of solar, uh, out of charge. So we're very grateful for the excess of electrical power that this pass is providing us. That's right, let us all praise the sun. Praise Cyro for the bounty of science juice that it giveth unto us. Anyway, the official uh, planet pack entry for Icarus tells us that it took a long time to discover this gem due to its size and proximity to the Inferno. Its appearance strongly inspires seafood, and a visit would be as exquisite. The ability to get here and back without bankrupting a KSC, melting or upsetting Gale's biosphere, would be treated with great prestige. I haven't got there yet, but I haven't, yeah, I'm not going to get back by any means. Yeah, radius is 160 kilometers, surface G.16, 11 biomes, and lots and lots of delta V needed for getting there and back. I tell you, it looks kind of cool, and I'd like to see if there's some sweet, tasty clam meat in that, uh, in that crevasse. At this distance, it's obviously going to be tidally locked to the parent sun, which means its orbit, its rotation period, will be basically the same as its day. So its orbit is about 213 hours. That works out to be about 35 days or 35 gale days. And um, yeah, I mean, I am going to obviously do some further corrections, but I'm going to have to think about sending some more spacecraft because this one probably, well, it's already out of date. And I think Sister Margaret, the first version, it should have enough Delta V, and if I'm a little more careful, I might be able to send it along. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to set land a spacecraft here and re return anytime soon, but you never know. I've got to figure out my electric situation, got to figure out my propulsion situation. Yeah, look at that. I pretty much made the encounter exactly halfway along the orbit, so the Delta V requirement would have been four times what I would expect. The big problem will be that I can make uh, the burns to make the orbits uh, more or less line up. The problem is that I will then be, uh, I will then have trouble setting up my synchronization between the two orbits. It could easily be dozens of orbits before the two bodies once again synchronize, and in that time, maybe I will be able to send another spacecraft. But anyway, as for now, exploration of the Galileo system continues. We will have to develop that resource mining base just because, honestly, it's a lot more interesting than watching all these space probes do maneuvers in deep space. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.